Hello, this is Craig at the Valve Studio, and I'm going to show you a little thing I found on Craigslist about, I don't know, 18 months ago. I finally got it on the bench, and I've been exploring it for about two weeks. And this is the first part of a series, um, uh, taking apart, doing analysis, and conf uh, understanding more about tube amplifier design. And I found this, like I said, on Craigslist, and this is a uh, Kamiko. Uh, Hawaiian steel guitar is from 1949 so it's 71 years old and the person that had this said uh, it's free it just needs to find a good home and I was like well that's me I guess um, so he gave it to me and it comes it comes with this beautiful enclosure uh, which is actually in really good condition it's not coming apart uh, the amplifier is over on the bench and it comes with a field coil speaker which is right here so and the output transformer is actually mounted on the back here so in this video series that we're going to do is uh we're going to explore all the aspects of this particular uh Kamiko amplifier um the field coil speaker and uh there's a couple things i want to spend a lot of time on is the it's a single-ended um output stage um and it also has a pinto preamp and so i'm going to take a lot of time to actually explore a lot of nuances of single ended am amplifier design particularly dealing with second harmonic generation and i also spend some time looking at this field coil speaker itself so in this uh, part here today <clears throat> i'm going to go over the the layout of the amplifier itself and the schematic and then i'm going to look at the uh, i'm going to take all the tubes out and I'll start looking at the circuit as it progresses. So I looked at the power transformer first, then I look at the capacitors for the filtering and make sure that they're fine and they don't have excessive leakage as well as what their ESR value is. And then I'm going to look at the rectifier itself and it, um, then I'm going to move on to the speaker and the output transformer as well as the field coil filtering for this amplifier. And I'm going to talk about biasing, and in the part of biasing, I'm going to take a lot of time to kind of explain uh, this tool that I worked on a project about four years ago. I've updated it, and I used it to actually determine that the current bias point that this is set at is is optimal for power output, but it's not optimal opt. <laughs> it's not optimum for uh, second harmonic distortion generation we'll go ahead and talk about that and then i think subsequent videos we will go through and look at the preamp stage and its biasing and its uh, uh distortion characteristics as well as the signal performance uh, across the entire amplifier we'll do a sound check and then i will wrap it up and i will have a functioning amplifier for my lab or in for my my office here at the valve studio so if you find any of this interesting uh, please stay tuned uh, this section i think is going to be maybe 35 40 minutes long and let's get started i have the amplifier removed from its case and then you can see that it's a three three tube design it's got a six sj7 pintoed preamp with a shield on it and a 6F6, this one actually is a 6F6G for glass, and an 80 rectifier tube. Looks it's fairly simple. It's got a quarter inch input jack and a volume control, no tone control, and this one is actually an on off switch. Here's the power transformer. The um, output transformer is actually on mounted onto the uh, uh, speaker basket, and it says here AC only. In the early days of tube uh, uh, radios, there were farm radios, and they ran on DC. But this one's AC only. So this is, you know, an early on design. Early on being probably 1940-ish. I didn't, done, I don't know exactly when it was. I suspect it's late 40s. I'll tell you why that is in a minute. Oh, one more thing. Uh, it uses a field coil speaker, and I expected there'd be four wires coming out, but there's only three here. So we'll have to figure that out. Is the wire missing or is it going to be able to do it with three wires? We'll determine that uh, as we go on. Okay. <clears throat> so I have it mounted on a couple of pieces of particle board. And that enables me to run the amplifier upside down. 
in a vertical orientation for all the tubes um, and I can run with the tubes and not have a problem with it banging down here and what I've started doing with amplifiers when I'll check them out is I'll print out the uh, pinouts of the tubes itself and I'll, I'll temporarily tape them to the design and I'll orient the pinout to match the physical layout of the tube so the preamp tube is here uh, the uh, power tube is here and this is the rectifier and the uh, output transformer and you can see that uh, this here was is not a vintage cord I don't know what that's off of but it's a two prong cord we'll fix that and the strain relief is kind of broken so we'll have to we'll just get rid of all this junk um, the there has been uh, some work done on this at some point because there are newer capacitors in here so much replace these coupling capacitors here with probably some 600 volt caps here and somebody placed a technician that passed placed a a filter capacitor across the power transformer uh, the rest of it looks fine these are vintage uh, vintage but before my time resistors and there is an old paper cap here so <clears throat> what we're going to do is what I found for this particular amplifier is I found this uh, schematic and this is a Kamiko lap steel amplifier from 1947 and this has the right tube complement 6xj7 6f6 a field coil speaker as well as a 80 rectifier tube but the, the um, uh, this particular schematic does not match my amplifier there are some significant differences uh, so I took, um, I redrew this schematic in Eagle, and I made it made it so it matches correctly with this this amplifier we have here, and it includes the you know the center taps and you know, all that kind of thing, as well as all of the uh, values for everything that we need to do the analysis. And uh, so I went through and measured everything in here, and determined if they if it works or not, and you can tell. Well, there's an old capacitor over here. This one actually is faulty, and we'll go into uh, how I checked the um, this uh, filter capacitor. But other than that, it looks pretty simple, and uh, we we'll, uh, we're going to take everything I have so far, which is the schematic, the real device here, and we're going to go step through step through the entire design, starting over here, and uh, determine as we move along we're not going to play everything in and see if it works uh, because uh, we don't know that yet we're going to look at the analysis we're going to determine everything and then we're going to slowly uh, populate the tubes in the circuit and check it out step by step let's look at the power transformer to verify its operation so I have all the tubes removed so there's no chance of uh, actually charging any capacitors and we'll, we will look at the open circuit voltage of this uh, power transformer. It has three secondaries, 5.5 5 volts secondary, 6.3 center tapped, and a high voltage center tapped. Um, and I have it running into my, uh, uh, powered off of my Variac. I'm going to slowly ramp this up and see what the output voltages are. And I have a voltmeter up here. So first thing I'm going to do is look across the high voltage secondary. And I am I am across this, the the entire secondary, not using the center tap at all. So we'll go ahead and turn this on, and I'll go up to 10 volts or so. And at 10 volts, it's about there, and we are at 60 volts here. So that means the turn ratio is six. So I expect when we get up to 100 volts, we should be about 600 volts. And then we get to one, 120 or so, or around there, it's gonna be like 660 volts. <clears throat> so we'll go, up to, we'll go up to 100 volts. And here at 100 volts, we're at 575. And up here, at, we're gonna go ahead and go up to 115. Because we're in the United States and we're at 664 so we'll go ahead and write that down 664 and we'll turn this off then we're going to go look at the 5 volt side the 5 volt secondary which is the 
filament on the 80 power, uh, rectifier tube. And that is 5.53. And the 6.3 secondary is 7.0. Okay, so we have 5.5.3 and 7.0. I got those written down here. Um those voltages are going to drop once we start pulling some current through the secondaries because of the power transformer uh, secondary coil resistance. So this transformer is working. Um, I guess at the time, because it has uh, the secondaries, uh, the 6.3 and the high voltage is center tap. That means we have some luxury in our circuit design. 6.3 is center tapped so um, it's going to reduce the hum that comes out of this full wave rectifier. Next we'll check the electrolytic. It's based in here and actually has four electrolytic capacitors in it. The values are written back here. The first one is a 20 microfarad at 350 volts. The second one is a 10 microfarad, and the third one is a 5 microfarad, both at 350 volts. And then it has a 20 microfarad at 25 volts. So I am going to use my Syncor LC53 uh, Z meter. And we're going to connect up and work our way through these capacitors. We're going to check with the Z meter. I can look at the capacitance as well as the leakage current. So I'm on the first one now. And the capacitor value is about 36 uh, microfarads. And since this is a th uh, 350 volt capacitor, we'll check the leakage at 300 volts. Okay, so it's running down and this is where it gets kind of tedious. You just have to sit here and hold the button in. And that's probably about right. Probably fully charged at this point, so we'll go if that gets 100, we'll write down 100. That's good enough. Next one is the 10. Actually, the 10 and the 5 are connected together. So the next capacitor to check, this should be about 15 micro microfarads. And it is 17.1. And its leakage at 300 volts is... Let this one run down. See what we get. Okay, that's not our. Yeah, I can't hold that thing. It's sliding. Figures. All right, let's do this again. Well, it's not zero, but it's it was down there. It's weird. I think I did this before, and I got it to be. Looks like this switch is a little dirty. No, it gets down to zero, so there's no leakage on that capacitor. Okay, the last one is the 20 microfarad at 25, 25 volts. Make sure you turn your Applied voltage down. So I'm at 25 over here, so I'm applying 25 volts to check the leakage. And this one is supposed to be 20, what did I say? 20, 20, 20 microfarads. And it's 163, which is not good. 
and its leakage current is not good. Okay, so this has got excessive leaking and the capacitor value is nowhere near where it's supposed to be. So of the four capacitors in here, three of them are good. All right, let's look at this again because I got some interesting results the first time. So the second time through, I put a got a, another voltmeter here, and I'm going to look at the charge voltage as these as I run these tests. All right, so the first one, the first capacitor was a 20. We'll check it, and it is at 36. And we'll dial up the uh, leakage test value, leakage test voltage. And you'll see that while this one is counting up, the other meter is counting down. So as we cl uh, approach 300 volts on this meter, this one will, should settle out to the actual leakage at, three, at 300 volts. And to do this, uh, you know, if we want to really be accurate, you got to hold this button down for a really long time. But we're at 140. All right, so that's the first uh, capacitor second capacitor is the 10 and the 5 connected in parallel and its capacitance is again 17.1 and it is also at 350 volts so we'll go ahead and run this one you'll see that this meter over here is counting up that one over there is counting down as the capacitor gets charged all right, so this is the second one, and we get down to, if we hold this button down a long time, we can get down to really small. Okay, so we're getting there now. All right, so we're at 10. All right, let's look at the last one. The last one was the one we had problems on before, but this is the 25 volt one, so we'll make sure we turn this down to 25 first. This is 20 microfarads at 20, 25 volts. So its capacitance is 163. And we're at 25 volts over here, so we'll run the we'll run the leakage again. And what you're gonna see over here is that it doesn't get to 25 volts. So the reason why the Z meter is flashing is because the uh, charge current is so high that ultimately means this will never really get up to 25 volts. So that 20 uh, microfarad capacitor has got excessive leakage and it is uh, no longer good. All right. Hope that explains what's going on from our abnormality from the first test. We'll check the ESR next. And what this is showing you, hopefully, is that leakage is something you need to test for if you're kind of serious about looking at these capacitors. Now I have a LC53, which is a luxury. You may want to figure out how to look at the leakage uh, current on your side as well. And you saw how fast this actually rose. A capacitor with zero leakage um, will rise pretty quickly. Next up, we're going to look at the ESR of the capacitors inside this uh, combined capacitor. And I'll let you know that the leakage current test that I just ran from the Z meter actually applies a 300 volt signal to the capacitor and looks at the leakage current. So we need to make sure we discharge it and I'm using my my handy dandy discharger here um, so we're just going to go through here and discharge these capacitors make sure they're low because we don't want to blow out the ESR meter that looks good there's a I made a there's a video about how many this, this this thing here Okay, the next one is I have on a e MESR 100 ESR meters. I'll go ahead and hook it up. The f ESR of the first capacitor is 
1.25 the next one is 0.667 and the last one is 0.382 all right which is great turn that off okay let's uh, continue on move on to the next component to check let's check out the operation of the rectifier it is an 80 rectifier and it feeds into a 20 microfarad 350 volt capacitor speakers not in here at all so this whole part of the circuit has been disconnected so all we're going to do is ramp this up slowly with my variac and we are going to see what this voltage ends up being here so what I have over here is my my uh, voltmeter is over here and my variac is back here and I'm going to slowly ramp it up and we will see what this um, a voltage ends up being across the capacitor itself okay so let me get my arm out of the way so you can see it okay so this the line voltage now is at 50 volts so the filament is is you know not quite warm of course but we're getting 192 volts out I'm gonna keep ramping it up I'm going to go up here to about 300 and we'll see what our line volt our input voltage is okay so we're at 300 volts now and my uh, my very the input to the uh, power transformer is about 78 volts so I fear if I ramp it up to 115 I will exceed the 350 volts here so um, hmm it's not a problem because we have a bunch of resistances involved and what ends up happening is there's resistance of the secondary uh, secondary coil here and it is actually 250 ohms and we have um, so we need to know what the current that this power supply is actually going to feed into here we don't know anything about the biasing yet so that so um, let's let's get an estimate on it though all right from our 6f6 let me turn this off and discharge that capacitor because it is at 200 volts here I don't want to do that okay so 6f6 the uh, tube data sheet shows a typical operating conditions uh, we're going to do a pentode connection here and it says that the uh, 285 volts at the at the uh, plate the um, plate current is 38 milliamps so if we run uh, if we run that down we're going to get a voltage drop across the rectifier tube we're also going to get a voltage drop across the uh, secondary coil resistance. So what I'm going to do is if we divide, if let's say that that's 350 uh, divided by, what did I say, 38. 38 is about 10K. So what I'm going to do is load this circuit down right here. I'm going to load this circuit at this point and kind of simulate the uh, current draw and we will actually uh, continue to ramp this up with all the voltage drops involved and see what this voltage ends up being once I pull about 36, 38 milliamps out of the high voltage circuit. Well, I just happen to have in all my junk of stuff I have a multi-tap power resistor and I've labeled it off here we have a 2.4, 4.8k, 7.2k and 9.8k so what I'm going to do is connect this up and we'll start drawing some current so we're going to go in here 
going to connect up over here and I'm going to connect that in there I don't know how hot this is going to get but I'm on the 10k position and then I'm going to come over here and connect it up to the output the uh, capacitor which is the red wire over here all right, so now what I have in here is I have a 10K resistor right across the uh, power supply uh, capacitor. So we'll do this again. I'll ramp it up. We know it starts conducting around 60 volts. All right, there's 60 volts input, and I'm getting 93 out. So we'll go and continue up and this is where we were before now we're getting 200, 209 volts out and we're going to go ahead and keep going we're going to get up to 115 and we're at 347 this is where I have to make a little judgment call on this guy one I made an estimate of the current draw of the of the, the 6F6 pintode power tube and if we draw more current then this voltage will end up being lower and we'll be under the voltage level of this capacitor so 350 volts now I think that this is it actually might be the original capacitor I can't really tell that from the solder joints at all but we did test this out to be fine and it is right at the 350 volts so we're going to continue on using this main capacitor that's in the in the uh, the power supply right now and after we do a little bit more exploration with the circuit we'll determine if we need to replace that one or not and we will do that by running the variac over here at a little lower voltage and make sure we don't get near 350 and then as we ramp it up and, and get to that point we will make that determination if it's safe to leave this one in Um, there's one last thing here so this capacitor you know this one remember now this one has two uh, this one has four capacitors in it one of those did test bad uh, we're, we're running the first one here at 350 volts and then it goes through this field coil which actually has a resistance of a thousand ohms and so that's that ends up being a 34 volt um, 34 volt drop across the field coil and so we'll be we'll be the rest of the capacitance over here will be fine but that one particular there is might be a problem so we're gonna check that out all right one last thing is I'm going to check my current draw here and that's not working oh it's gonna go this way And right now we are uh, exactly at 35 milliamps. So this is pretty close. Uh, this actually might be the uh, design spec for this amplifier. We'll determine that. Make sure we discharge the cap here. Oh, we already got a 10K resistor across there. Okay. Oh, uh, did that get hot? Yeah, that got a little hot there. I do have it on a uh, piece of material here. So I have my single-ended power stage load line bias tool opened up here, and I have it loaded up with uh, 6F6. And if we uh, kind of briefly look at the schematic again, so you have our power transformer, our rectifier, first capacitor, field coil, um, inductor, which has got an equivalence of 1,000 ohms, and our screen is connected directly to um, this part right here <clears throat> this point right here so if we look at this this whole bus right here is actually vb v battery uh, this is the high voltage line this voltage over here uh, we don't actually know but we'll go ahead and i'll show you how i got that and the uh, we don't know what the voltage drop is across the 80 rectifier and we also have the um, secondary high voltage uh, taps 
uh, DC resistance. So these are the resistors we're looking at here. We're looking at uh, uh, the field coil and the rectifier equivalent resistance here, the output transformer primary DC resistance, and um, particularly if we want to add a screen resistor, because on the schematic itself, there's no screen resistor itself. So you may want to look at uh, the impact of adding that and our uh, biasing uh, resistor down on the cathode. So if we look at the uh, power train, the uh, the uh, tongue cell data sheet here, um, maximum plate voltage is 375, screen voltage is 285, 11 watt dissipation on the plate, and 3.75 on the screen. Their recommended values right here uh, are for the plate voltage 250 and 285, and they kind of come down and they they kind of show you down at the bottom. Two things to look at is the um, zero signal plate current is 34 and the screen current 6.5 um, this gives you a ratio right here that's about 5.3 and our output is somewhere between three and a half and 4.8 at around eight percent to nine percent distortion okay so first off is this part of the circuit over here actually took some subsequent measurements that coupled along with the um, data sheet for the rectifier, I came up with a uh, I came up with this equivalent resistance here. So I'll just briefly show you how I did that. So I first started with this output characteristics from the um, 80 data sheet, and uh, I measured the open circuit voltage of the uh, power transformer, and it's about 300. Um, 50 360 volts uh, plate to plate effectively so I kind of drew an interpolated line in here with uh, engage and I outputted um, I outputted all these variables or these uh, these readings from engage itself and I have those plotted over here that is the uh, this big thick blue line then I did a curve fit on that line and there's a polynomial here and then there's also a, a linear line so then I took some real measurements on the circuit um, I had that load resistor of uh, 12k 10k 7.2k 4.8k and I measured the uh, current itself this is a I put this resistor right here from here to ground and um, I measured the current and I measured the DC voltage at that point. And from this, I was able to determine that that's actually pretty linear. And the slope of this line kind of tells me what the equivalent resistance is. So our equivalent resistor over, resistance over here is about 2000 ohms. And our open circuit voltage is 418 volts. So uh, the actual value that we have in here the bias tool for ps over here i used 400 418 and this rps is um 2000 from the rectifier and 1000 from the field coil which gives us our b plus so everything looking back this way is a 2000 ohm output impedance and this is a thousand so that this point right here is 418 this point right here is um no, I'm sorry. This point, this entire point right here is, is uh, this is the PS part of it. Actually, it's kind of upstream from the rectifier. Whatever, it doesn't matter. We have the, we have the equivalent resistance looking from the power supply uh, back into this entire circuit. It's 3,000 ohms. That equivalent is RPS here. This we got from the actual... Uh, um, looking at the resistance of the secondary or the primary of the output transformer and that is believe it I measured it at 760 ohms all right so let's go down I ran this through engage got all these readings out and I got my tool open here and um, 
So from here, using this part of the tool, we can kind of see that, you know, where we stand is actually pretty good, except our screen voltage, because we're directly connected up here, the tool actually starts kind of default at 250. But we need to set it to the value that gets out, that comes out from VB. So if we look down here, VB is 300 volts. All right, so there's already a problem because uh, 296 is higher than um, than the data sheet re re allows. Oops, where am I going here? The data sheet itself. Um, hold on, I'm getting a little confused here. The data sheet itself. Remember, I said it, the maximum screen voltage is 275. So <clears throat> that is a little high. Uh, uh, we need to drop that down. So that means that we do need to have, uh, we need, we do need to add in a screen resistor. All right. So let's, let's go back and, uh, let's, let's actually put it back. Well, let's just see what our, 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 uh, harmonic analysis is. If we, if we put it at 285, which is right there. And then we go down and we rerun this second cell. All right, so if we look at this curve here, we're actually kind of in the center. So we'll have asymmetric distort, or we'll have symmetric distortion, which leads to a uh, more prevalent of the third and fifth harmonic for the distortion. And we can see that down here on the FFT of the output transformer uh, waveform driving that. And so you can kind of see that this is the fundamental. The third is, is um, is is the prominent harmonic and it is actually up 11 db from the from the second so we want to modify something in the circuit to get this behavior to be different so i played around with this a little bit and i found that uh let's drop if we drop this green voltage down to about 200 volts you'll see all the lines in the graph kind of compressed downwards okay that's that's normal if we're at that 200 at, if we just let's say we add a screen resistor and kick the screen voltage down to to 280 there's a couple changes that actually took place that i didn't talk about so back up at 285 we were at five watts at 0.3 uh, percent distortion so we're really pretty close to being in the center of this uh, spread if we go down to 200, we're, we decrease our power output by about a watt and a quarter, but our distortion goes up to 5%, which is fine. And um, the play current is still at 34. This is 6.4. So this gives us a, a um, collector current of 40 milliamps. And in order to get this particular bias point we need a 330 ohm resistor uh, for the cathode biasing and that gives us this this kind of characteristic down here that we that we just looked at okay nope all right so if we go back down to 200 and we run this again so run this again and you can see this curve now doesn't isn't quite an ass it's more like a bowed more on the top so that implies that, you know, as we increase the amplitude, the dry voltage, we'll be getting more and more of the, into this nonlinearity that is asymmetric. So we'll have more prevalence of the second harmonic. So this is where we are now. So you can see our second harmonic at this drive level of 10 is minus 40 and the, the third is minus 50 or, or so. And, um, the second is 9.9 9 dB down from the second, so this is this is prevalent here, but we don't have we don't have a lot of distortion quite yet. If we were to turn this up to say like 20, this green line will end up being larger, so we'll be a little bit further along in the, in here. But you can also see that we, we're getting like a little bit of symmetry on this graph because. This deviates down from a line, this one deviates up, and you can see that in the distribution of the harmonics. 
So we're minus 34 here and we're minus 36. So we still have more second. We're 2 dB down from the second. So what can we do about that? I think what we need to do... I play with this and move this around. And when you move, the only thing really you can change at this point, because we have a fixed uh, rectifier and a fixed power transformer, we can only really vary these two variables the plate current as well as the screen voltage because the um, we don't get a choice of manipulating the um, um, the the plate voltage anymore because the plate voltage due to the circuit configuration this plate voltage right here is really based on the current that's going down through here because of all these incurred voltage drops from the power supply so we don't have the flexibility to move that. The only one we can move is the, is the plate current. And by doing that, what you're going to see is I'm going to go ahead and vary the plate current. And you'll see this point moving in two dimensions because it, it does change the, uh, the plate voltage. So <clears throat> if we were to move it down, you'll see that it's moving down and it's also decreasing the plate voltage. Okay, so I found that at 27 milliamps, we still get out 3.5 watts of power at 5% distortion. And if we, and we have our screen voltage still set at 200, that gives us a V battery of 3, 321. Uh, the plate, because of the drop in the output transformer resistance, is down at 300. Uh, and this gives us a 32 milliamp total. Uh, so our screen resistor worked out to be 24K, and our our, our uh, cathode bias resistor will be about 510 ohms. And so if we look down here, we rerun this cell here. So that actually moved us a little further up along this curve, which is expected. So if we look over here, we're just looking at the relative peak difference in the harmonic content. So this is minus 32, this is minus 49. So this is six, 16 dB down from the second harmonic. So this is primarily second order, har, second order uh, distortion. So if we, drive, if we drive the circuit harder, we get a larger voltage swing here. And you'll see that we're, we're still uh, primarily second har, harmonic. Um, and the third is actually uh, still 9 dB down. If we go any if we go any further, we'll kind of move this this uh, di difference here up. So I think that that's what I'm going to do. Um, I believe I am going to add a 24k resistor here, and I'm going to make this 24k, which will drop my screen voltage down to 200 volts. And I'm going to set my bias current here at 27 milliamps. And that will require that I have put in a about 510 ohm cathode uh, bias resistor. And then we'll go look at the, uh, the output performance and kind of see that if our equations and our predictions are correct. Well, that about wraps it up for this segment. We covered a lot of ground in this video. And next time, we're going to continue on looking at this 1949 Kamiko pedal steel guitar amplifier. And we will look at the preamp stage as well as the overall signal performance. And we'll go through a sound check. So, uh, thanks for watching. This is Craig at the Valve Studio.